in today's show. And the highest growth we're actually seeing on YouTube right now is the one to three hour category. It's like making videos, not just 10 minutes, but over an hour, two hours, three hours is how Rogan blew up is the podcasts are not just 15 minute quick hits, but three hour long deep dives into people's stories. Um, so that YouTube doesn't have any competition yet. And it's only growing and getting bigger. Uh, for the short form, there's a lot of competition. There's YouTube shorts, there's TikTok, there's Instagram reels. Uh, everybody has their own like stories clone. So there's a lot of competition on the short side of thing. Who's going to win? I don't know. I'm everywhere. I like to play in all of them and see what I like and what ends up working. I'm, I'm platform agnostic. Like I want to help people. I want to serve, right? I'm trying to solve the world's biggest problem. I need to get video content out there. And as of right now for long form, YouTube is the king and there's nothing even close as a number two. In today's ultra competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Welcome back to the show. This is The Real Jason Duncan. Today's guest is Evan Carmichael. He believes in entrepreneurs. Gary Vaynerchuk called him the DJ who inspires people. Ed Milet called him the modern day Napoleon Hill. At age 19, he built and sold a biotech company. Then at age 22, he becomes a venture capitalist, investing as much as $15 million in other people's businesses and learned a lot. But it wasn't really until he started writing content, sharing content, and then eventually producing video content that the world began to realize who this guy is. Evan Carmichael now has a YouTube channel with over 3.4 million subscribers, over 300 million views. He's now written four books. His most recent book, Built to Serve, it just came out the beginning part of 2022. And he speaks globally about solving the world's biggest problem, which is, as he's going to reveal in the show, believing in yourself. He reveals that is the issue. And he talks about his story about being a Canadian and, and how he uh, has been through his success, been able to inspire other people to believe in themselves as an entrepreneur. And he, uh, you know, like here in the United States where I am, there's Inc. Magazine that lists how, how great companies are. And he had another, he had a, there's a magazine, I think he called Profit in Canada, did the same thing that helped kind of propel him to notoriety so that he could actually use that platform to influence other people. So um, he's Forbes has named him one of the world's top 40 social marketing talents. Inc. Magazine named him one of 100, one of the 100 great leadership speakers and 25 social media keynote speakers that you need to know. And he's here on my show today, the root of all success. So please help me welcome the one, the only Evan Carmichael. Well, Evan, thank you so much for being on the show and welcome to the root of all success, my man. Jason Duncan, the real Jason Duncan. Let's go. Happy to be here, man. Well, I love how uh, networking affects our lives because without networking, I would know who you are. You would not know who I am, at least not now. Um, but I, I, you know, I've known who you are for a while, but it was by networking through different people that you and I got connected. And we had a conversation, I guess about a year ago about my YouTube channel and some things I had going on and you and what you had doing, but, but I'm grateful for networking. So thank you for, for being here. So I, I want to ask you this. So not many people can say that they did what you did, built and sold a biotech software company at age 19. Um, I have a 19-year-old daughter and 21-year-old son. Neither of them are prepared to build any biotech software. So why, how, how did you get your start in that? Like what, where, where did that start in your life so that you could do that at 19? Yeah. So I'm 42, I guess, by the time this thing comes out. So when I was 19, entrepreneurship also wasn't a thing. 
So it wasn't top of mind. There was no TikTok or YouTube or Instagram of, you know, people showing off their entrepreneurial ventures. So you kind of had to be crazy to be an entrepreneur. And I didn't know that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, to be honest. I thought I wanted to be a banker. If you look at my high school yearbook, graduating high school, what do you want to be in 10 years? They kind of ask you that question. Mine was, I want to be a VP at an investment bank. That's, that's kind of my, that was my path. And then I got to university and I connected with two people who had started a software company. So I didn't start it, but I joined as a 30% owner in the business. And I, I really liked it. It seemed interesting. I had a lot of entrepreneurial tendencies growing up, selling baseball cars and garage sales and that kind of stuff, but never thought that that would be a career. It's like, okay, that was fun. Go be an investment banker. And something kept pulling me in towards joining these guys in their business. And the deal was basically... You make 300 bucks a month and you have 30% of this company. So it's all upside on the equity. It's not, <laughs> it's not the big payday. And the toughest choice of my life was, was, do I take the investment banking jobs at the companies that I wanted to? And you know, companies were flying me out to New York and put me up in the Waldorf Astoria and kind of recruiting me to join their company. And that was the hardest decision. Like, okay, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this software company and try to make a go of it instead of taking that big job. Uh, and it was more just a matter of listening to my instinct in that I would regret it if I didn't do it. Honestly, that's more than anything else. Like I would regret it if I didn't take action. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs have that same sentiment. You know, they, they take the risk, they jump into something, if nothing else, to, to do what you just did to say, I want to stave off what potential regret might, be, might come later. Because if I don't do it, well, I'll wonder, what if, what if that had hit? So after you sold the, you got, you sold the biotech software company at age 19, that sets you up for a totally different life. Now you've got access to capital. You're doing things that uh, most 19, 20 year olds don't have access to. uh, And you become a venture capitalist at age 22. So a couple of short years after that, you're a venture capitalist, you're doing half a million dollar deals and $15 million deals. Did you only get into that because you now had the money or was there something else that, that allowed you or encouraged you to get into that? So, I mean, I always cared about money. I mean, I wanted to be an investment banker. I, I was always the banker in Monopoly. You know, I always was curious <laughs> about making money. It was kind of in me, but I didn't know how to raise money. And the honest answer is I was in my business. We were thinking about raising money. So as we were growing, like, do we need to raise money? Do we need to expand? And we, we got bought before we needed to raise. That was, that was one of our conundrums was, do we sell now and get an, a nice exit or do we raise capital and then try to blow up the business? And then I actually wanted to stay in the company and grow. My partners wanted to sell more for personal reasons. And so we sold the company and I, I never knew what it was like to raise capital. So when I sold my business, you do all the things, you travel for a bit and you have fun. And, um, but I'm not the kind of guy who just likes to sit on the beach. You know, I, I grow restless after two days. And so I started saying yes to a whole bunch of things. And one of them was being in a venture capital firm. And uh, I was just more curious about what's the process of raising money. And at that time, I only knew one business, my business. And when you get into venture capital, you get to see all sorts of businesses, high growth businesses. And the people I was with, they, the, the founders of the firm were all in their 60s or 70s, had tons of knowledge. And that was my that was my entrepreneur MBA, you know, to really learn about how different businesses work and how to think strategically about it. So it's not just the one industry that I knew myself. So it's really just curiosity and me just saying yes, not that it was this this grand plan that I was going to sell my business and then become a venture capitalist. So when you do, when you're doing the VC stuff, are you, are you doing this? And maybe, maybe you said this and I just wasn't paying attention, but did you do this alone or did you join a firm to kind of put your money in the firm to, to, to lend out and invest in other people? Were you doing so I, Yeah. I joined the firm. There was one guy, there was a four, four person firm, like four senior partners in the firm. One of them focused on angel investing and the other three did venture capital. And the guy who focused on angel, after I sold my business, he wanted to meet and, and just grab coffee. And I was just saying yes to meetings and coffees and lunches because I, I, I didn't know what to do. I kind of had nothing to do. And I needed to figure out what my next thing was because I, I don't want to just lie on a beach or sit on my couch all day. And he said, hey, why don't you join us? You know, why, don't you, why don't you come and join our company for a little bit? And I said, sure, why not? I gave it a shot. And I was with them 
for a year and a half, maybe just under two years before I moved on to my next thing, which is building up my own brand. But I, I learned a lot in the process just to get mentored. And that was really the big reasons. Like I cared about financing. I never had to do it. So I was curious about it. And I thought I would be able to learn from people. I'm 22. These guys are in their 60s and 70s. They knew this inside out. And they were four great mentors for me in different areas. And that really helped propel my, my business and entrepreneur knowledge forward beyond just my own little experience. So, how, so at the biotech firm, you were making how much per week? I was making 300 bucks a month in the start. Um, <laughs> and that was, that was about a year or so of just really struggling and not knowing what to do. And I, I made it, you know, Jason, I made it really hard on myself. Like I was too embarrassed to tell my friends I was struggling. I was too ashamed to say I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well. You know, I'd say I'm, I'm hustling, I'm living the entrepreneur life, but really I was just alone and didn't know who to talk to. And wow it could have been so much easier. I mean, I wish I had your show to be able to listen to and watch and help me on, on my path. Um, and then, and then, you know, we had a couple breaks and we could talk about that if you want. And we started doing well and it just became a year and a half of explosive growth that then led to us being acquired. Um, and then all of a sudden I had nothing to do. So, so the $300 a month turned into what, like, tell, give me a sense of how much money this turned into. Cause that's the risk that I think so many entrepreneurs want to take because of the payoff and it doesn't happen for everybody, but what, what was it? So 300 bucks was the starting point. It ended up being a seven figure exit for the company. So nice chunk of change when you're 22, not, not, uh, something that you're going to live off the rest of your life for. Yeah, but but didn't have to go get a job again. You know, didn't have to go work for someone else again if I didn't want to. But I also didn't know what I wanted to do next, and so it was the uh, the setup to the next step. But I, I had to go do the work to find out what the next step was. So as a VC, kind of working with a VC firm, I, I'm not I, I'm not familiar with how that works. But but I would assume that 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 the, the venture capital firm has investors who are putting money in. Maybe you put your own money in, maybe you didn't, and then you're just helping identify opportunities to invest and acquire. Is that is that essentially that's a Cliff Notes version of how that works? Yeah, my main role was to help bring new business in. So the main partners were again in their 60s or 70s. They they knew the street, but they didn't, they knew all of that. They knew they had the connections to all the money, but they didn't want to do the work to go find the people. And so me, this kind of young hustler, just sold my business, looking for the next thing to do. I made it my job to go off and find companies that would be interested in raising money for their business. And there's only, most businesses don't qualify for venture capital. They just don't grow fast enough. They don't throw off enough of a, of a return. Uh, and so, you know, VCs are interested in them. So I made it my priority to go find the companies that were growing really quickly, who needed capital in making connections and making introductions. And, you know, you talk about networking at the start of the show, networking my way to find the right people to then make some deals happen. And the most important part of that was just being able to see how, how the VCs, I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't bring any VC knowledge, right? All I did was I sold my business and I, I was hungry and eager to learn and excited for a new challenge or opportunity. And in, in bringing in deals, they weren't coming in because of me, they're coming in for the VC and the funding. And so I got to sit in on all the meetings and I got to read all the business plans. And I got to see all the mistakes they're making. I got to see how the VCs, um, the three main partners were deconstructing a deal and giving the entrepreneurs advice. And you get access to so many different industries that was really cool to learn to see kind of how to grow a business and scale and get it funded. And again, it was my, it was my next step. I didn't, I didn't, I knew I didn't want to be a VC forever, but I didn't know until I got into it. Like we often judge the thing yeah. that we want to do next. I didn't know what I want to do next. So I said yes to a bunch of stuff. That's the thing that stuck the most. And it stuck for a year and a half, two years. And then I moved on to starting to help entrepreneurs on a bigger scale through my website, eventually YouTube and so on. So as a VC, when you were doing this, I, I, I'd like to hear your biggest disaster story. Like you thought this is going to be the greatest thing ever. And you brought it to the firm and it's like, ah, this, this was terrible. If you got one of those, if you could share, because I mean, you're a very successful dude, it would be cool to see that you're human like us and you make bad decisions. <laughs> Honestly, I think the biggest mistake was, was being too cautious, not being too aggressive. Really? Yeah. Like I think the biggest ones would be ones that I didn't bring the partners instead of ones that I should. I was, I think 
I think we, there's this misconception entrepreneurs have to be really risk. Like you have to love risk. I don't like risk. I'm not a, I'm not a risk loving guy. I'm, I'm a pretty safe guy. And I think honestly, back to the idea of regret, like not doing a thing and regretting it is the biggest risk of all. And so I was so worried about disappointing them or bringing in the wrong deal that I, that I didn't bring enough deals in that I had deals like in my hand and look at business funds, but I'd always over critique them and then wouldn't show them uh, in time. And then we lose the deal. So I think the biggest ones are actually the lost deals as opposed to the ones that I brought that they said that I sucked at. Um, and I had to, even the willingness to ask for help. Like my job was to screen business plans and bring in people to then present to them. And I needed to know better, how do I screen a business plan and make an assessment? Because sometimes the, the entrepreneur could be great, but their business plan or their executive summary wasn't fantastic. Maybe they suck at actually writing the exact summary, but the business could be on fire. And I didn't have enough context to know. So I'm always looking for like the, the perfect thing where really if you hit seven out of 10 criteria, as an example, they would want to have the meeting. So yeah, honestly, I think the biggest mistake was just being too perfect and not bringing in enough deals. I always say that if you lined up a hundred entrepreneurs and ask them what their regrets, uh, you know, what are they, what, what regrets categories would they have? 99 of them would say I, it's because I didn't do something. And only one would say it's because I did something. So I think that what your, your story is kind of the same. It's the regret, the, the mistakes that we made is what we, we were too cautious, didn't do something, not that we did it and regretted that we had done it. So I think your story kind of corroborates that. What's on the other end of things, was there one big, huge win that you brought to the table that you're proud of that you talk about? My favorite win actually wasn't so much the size of the deal. It was more the VCs, for whatever reason, loved this business that I brought in and ended up serving as their advisors. So joined the board, became their advisors, and I got to sit in on all of their meetings. So my strategy, how do I find the right companies? Well, we've got, uh, in Canada, we've got a, a company called Profit that ranks businesses. It's similar to uh, the Inc. 500, 5,000, et cetera, like fastest growing companies in, in the country. And that's who I would target. I'd go after the people who are already really growing quickly. So they have a business. They often really need capital uh, to continue their expansion. And so I would target them and say, Hey, I'm at this firm. I'd love to talk about if you need money for your business or not. Uh, and this one company, we're growing really quickly doing the education space. And instead of giving them money, they decided that the best thing was they needed more mentorship. And so they actually retained the VCs as a contract to join the board and give them guidance. And I got to sit in all the meetings. And so it was really cool because most of what I sat in on was just the pitch. And, and then whether we did a deal or not and, and getting them ready to, to kind of raise the money, et cetera, hire a management team, make sure they had the right CEO and team installed, et cetera. But this was cool because I got to sit in on the actual operations and uh, I forget what the cadence was. It was every week or every two weeks, uh, we'd be on either a call or go see them at their office. And I basically said nothing, but I was just fly on the wall, learning, being a sponge and seeing how they thought really just again, expanded my awareness of, oh my gosh, we did so many things wrong in my business. Like, this is really cool to see how these guys operate. And so that was my more personal favorite win because I learned a lot and took away a lot from it. I don't think that people who are, uh, when they think about venture capitalist firms, they don't think about that side of things, that there are genuinely good people trying to help businesses grow. Cause I think the venture vulture, you know, we, we, there's lots of negative connotations around venture capital, just generally speaking, I think fair or unfair, whether, whether or not it is, I don't, but I don't think they think about what you experience there is like, Hey, we really are interested in this. Do you need money? And I'm like, well, actually we don't need money. We need mentorship, which was smart on their part because they got access to you and other amazingly smart people to do it. So once you, once you, you said you, you worked at the VC firm, I think just for a couple of years, it wasn't, wasn't a long term. Is that right? Yeah. A like year and a half It's under two years. So what was your next step? I mean, you've built a company and sold it. Now you're helping, you know, build other companies for sale and for acquisition. You did that for a little while. What was the next step in your entrepreneurial journey? So I knew I wanted to help entrepreneurs and I, and I can, articulate a purpose a lot more easily now after I've done you know a lot of thinking on it. But it, at the time, I was just confused and didn't know what I wanted to do next. But I knew I wanted to help entrepreneurs. 
And ultimately, I think your purpose comes from your pain. You know, whatever you struggled the most with is what you want to help other people through. And because I struggled so much as an entrepreneur, I wanted to make the path easier for other entrepreneurs so they didn't have to struggle as much. And so it started with my website. So I, as a result of selling my company at 22, young entrepreneur, success story, I got asked to do a bunch of speaking. I got asked to represent my country, Canada, at, at, at international trade delegations and all that kind of stuff. So I thought I need a website to, to kind of share what I'm doing and, and maybe people want, want to work with me or hire me to speak. Um, and then when I joined the VC firm, I used the website to also drive leads for the web, for the business. So I would, I would write articles about raising capital and I, I just used basic Google SEO at the time. It was pretty premature. Not a lot of people were doing it. And I used it to drive uh, leads for my business, uh, for the VC firm. As I was doing that, a lot of people started to write to me to say, Hey, can I contribute an article to your website? And it was just off my name, evancarmichael.com. I wasn't, didn't overthink it. Uh, I'm a marketing coach. I'm, I'm, um, I'm an accountant. I'm a lawyer. I'm a whatever that relates still to entrepreneurs. Can I create a piece of content for your website? I thought, sure. You know, why not? I mean, it helps entrepreneurs. Maybe it helps bring in some more leads for me, leads for you. Let's do it. And that then became my next business and realizing, oh, okay. YouTube AdSense became a thing where you can run ads against your website. I started making a little bit of money off of that without optimizing anything. And then I realized, huh, if I optimized it and then I got more people to write for the website, I could have a business here. And that became, I was doing venture capital stuff for probably like a year solid. And then I did half a year of, of like mixed between the both where I was making my website to help the business. But then the website started taking off. Like I kind of wanted, like I've learned what I needed to learn from VC. I kind of want to go off and do this new thing and then built the website. People know me now from my YouTube channel, but before that we had a website with six figures uh, of content, um, like a hundred thousand plus pages of content. We had 5,000 people writing for the website, I had a whole team based around that and, and advertising was the business model. And again, it was just an experiment. So it's like, when you don't know what to do next, you just say yes. And you try stuff and most of it doesn't work, but every now and then you hit on something that like that was really cool. That's really fun. I'm really curious about that. And it's worth a little bit more exploration. And every now and then it leads to your next big breakthrough. So you're doing this website, you're writing articles, uh, SEO is kind of coming. It's, it's new on the, on the, on the, on the uh, scene. Other people are helping write articles. Now you're a hundred thousand plus articles on this website. You're making a little bit of money. How much money at the time was were the ads bringing in? Because that was relatively new back then. So was that more or less than what would be now in the equivalent of uh, eyeballs on the site? Um, I don't know relatively how much it would be. I suspect it would be more now just because it's a more mature platform, but it's harder to rank. So yeah. my model basically became, I got so good at SEO I learned it, I hacked it, I figured it out. And then I would, I would do outreach to people to get their content. So at the beginning, it was me writing everything, right? And, and that's, that is not scalable. Like you, then I have to be me showing up every day to write. Then people started to volunteer to write for my site. Like, oh, that's cool. Sure, why not? But it wasn't consistent. And so what we ended up doing was, hey, this becomes a model. Why don't I go and outreach to people who already had, the easiest thing to do was they already have a newsletter, they already have content somewhere. So if you're already making a newsletter for your audience, give me the content, I'll put it up on my site, give you credit, help drive traffic to your website, and we'll, we'll make money from advertising on the site. We would often usually outrank them for their own content. So they have a website, they don't know what they're doing with SEO, they're, they're, a, they're a business coach, they're a lawyer, they're an accountant, like an accountant doesn't really wanna learn about SEO, but has a lot of knowledge on how to be a great accountant. It's like, great, give me your content about all the things account, uh, entrepreneurs need to know about accounting. We'll put it up on our site. We'll rank well for it. And then we'll drive leads to your website. It's like, how much do I pay for that? Free, we'll make money off the ads and we'll just drive leads to you. And so we ended up outranking them for their own content, um, but th them being happy because they were not ranking for their own content in the first place. And because we knew the SEO tricks getting people to see the content and ho hopefully also kind of guiding entrepreneurs to good resources, right? When somebody's searching, how do I X? 
here's a great resource that pops up. And we had, I don't know, I had 10 people on my team helping do that. I, I, I'm struggle looking back, you know, in terms of actual numbers there, but it was, it was, a, it was a great business. Um, I kind of got bored of it because it just kept feeling like a publishing game and I'm much more of a visual person. And so again, YouTube came out in, in 2009, I made my first video. Uh, and at the time it was not an education platform in 2009 was the first year that somebody got a million subscribers on YouTube. So like YouTube wasn't a thing, being a YouTuber wasn't a thing, but it was a visual thing. And I'd much rather make video content than writing up content and I'd much rather consume video content than, than reading. And so like, okay, I'm going to experiment. Let's try making a YouTube video. All right. So now that we get, that's what I was waiting for is that this bridge into YouTube, because you're one yeah. of the top YouTube guys. I mean, you've got 3.4 something million followers, subscribers rather on, on YouTube. And most of your videos are, um, you know, it's not necessarily you talking. It's, 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 it's voiceovers about other amazing people that you've interviewed or you've talked to, or you've written about, and uh, you, you've done a great job. I'm great is an understatement. You done a great job building a brand around uh, visual content on YouTube. Was that what you just explained? Was that really all there was to it? It's like I was writing, but I really would rather do video. And that's how you just kind of eased into it. Or did you have a bigger plan in mind? Like, I think I could build an empire. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was no big plan, Jason. There was no big plan. I'm not, I'm not that smart. Uh, I did not know where YouTube was going. I just happen to be there and I like video and I do like to share other people's messages. That's, that's what saved my business. You know, my, in that software company, what made the difference from me struggling and making 300 bucks a month to then being able to rapidly grow and sell is by modeling success. I looked at Bill Gates, how he built Microsoft said, if Bill Gates can do that, how can I model that for me to get success? And that's what ended up saving my business. And so ever since then it's, Hey, I'm trying to figure something out. I don't have to be a genius. Somebody's figured it out already. Let me learn from them. And so a lot of my content is sharing other people's stories to say, hey, here's where you can learn from Bill Gates, or here's where you can learn from Oprah, or here's where you can learn from, you know, whoever. And I love that. And like, I still love that myself. And I try to share that with the world. But again, it started as this little simple experiment. I love just experimenting, right? Like, how did I get into the VC business? Well, I tried it and it was fun. So I stuck with it for a little bit. Then I tried the website and I stuck with, and that was cool. And I stuck with that for, more than a little bit. I forget how many years I was doing that. Uh, let's see. 2009 was my first video. I was born in 1980. So I was 29. So from 20, 22 to 24 ish, I was doing VC work and then 24 to 29, I was doing the website. So five years, five and a half years of building, building, scaling up the website and then deciding I want to do video. And when you find the thing that you love, that's when I find it People f feel that this is really risky. I don't feel that it's as risky. So I, when I knew I wanted to do video, it wasn't after my first video, but I did a couple of videos like, this is it. This is what I want to do. I, I shut down my website. It was a thing that was paying me, bringing in money. I had you know 10 people or so on my team. And overnight, I, I shut down the whole website and just threw up a picture on my homepage. My homepage became a picture. All the content was gone. And it was just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do YouTube now. And I moved my team over. My base listener was actually my team. Like I've got 10 people. What am I going to do with them? And I talked to them and, and figured out positions for them to go and do. And it, there was a big hit kind of revenue wise because I didn't know how I was making money on YouTube yet. But it felt like the right thing to do after the experimenting and the tasting and the trying. When did you hit your uh, million subscriber mark? Wild, wow, dude. Uh, the numbers are on my homepage, but my first year I had 25 subscribers and, and five years in, I had 7,000 subscribers. So a long time. That's a long time, dude. That's <laughs> a long time. And, and there's a couple factors there. One YouTube wasn't what it is now. Like YouTube is an education platform. Now people will go to learn yeah. if we're making this video and it's going to live on YouTube, people will watch it. Where back in 2009, it was, it was silly animal videos and man falls downstairs, like really meme stuff. Um, I made a video that was six minutes long. That was, I was really super proud of. It was the first video that hit a million views on my channel. And the people around me were telling me, dude, nobody's going to watch a six minute video on YouTube. 
Like you don't understand how YouTube works. There's no way that's going to take off for you. Uh, and I mean, it, it did well, but six minutes, we're talking six minutes being long. Now Joe Rogan's making four hour, you know, podcasts on YouTube. And so it's, it's changed um, and is a place for education. So when people ask me, is it too late? No, it's still, it's still super early for education, thought leadership. Um, and also I sucked, dude. Like I sucked at the beginning. I was um, shy, nervous, introvert, judged myself, hated everything I put up. It was 350 videos before I could actually watch my own videos and wouldn't be embarrassed. You know, 350 wow. public videos before I wasn't just completely embarrassed. I couldn't watch myself back. I just hated it. Um, and 700 videos until I watched, I inspired myself. I watched the videos like, you know what? I'm kind of starting to get good at this thing, man. <laughs> Making videos. 700 videos in, right? And so the only thing I had for me was I kept going. I kept going. And most people quit too soon. And I think people can get there faster. Like it doesn't have to take you five years to get the 7,000 subscribers. Um, I don't know when I crossed a million. It was definitely a lot longer in, but, but people can get there faster with guidance, with mentorship, with more charisma and, and you know, skills and talent than I have. And just YouTube is ready now where people are going there to search for how they can learn things. Where do you, where do you think we're going with this YouTube thing? Because you've, you like, you've built this great channel, 3.4 plus million uh, subscribers watching your channel and it's all educational, inspirational content. Uh, I don't think you have any funny cat videos on there <laughs> that I've seen, but where's this going? Is it, is it really just going to continue to ratchet up that education and information or is it going somewhere different? So I'm not fantastic at predicting the future. I just try stuff and I see what I like and what's working and just keep going with it. If, if I look at what's going on with, with YouTube and maybe even broader, more just education and social media, you've got long form and then you've got the short form. And YouTube is, is the king of long form and there's nothing even close. And long form I'd say is 10 minutes plus if you're making video content. Instagram tried to do it with IGTV. It, it didn't work. Nobody's going to Instagram to sit there and watch a long form video. So YouTube is the only place that people will go to consume long form video. You can get a podcast, which is audio only. That's a great kind of distant number two, but for video, it's, it's the only place. Uh, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. You know, everybody pretends to be like, I'm going to be a YouTube killer. You know, you're not, at least not yet. And the highest growth we're actually seeing on YouTube right now is the one, the three hour category. It's like making videos, not just 10 minutes, but over an hour, two hours, three hours is how Rogan blew up is the podcasts are not just 15 minute quick hits, but three hour long deep dives into people's stories. Um, so that YouTube doesn't have any competition yet. And it's only growing and getting bigger uh, for the short form. There's a lot of competition. There's YouTube shorts, there's TikTok, there's Instagram reels. Uh, everybody has their own like stories clone. So there's a lot of competition on the short side of thing. Who's going to win? I don't know. I'm everywhere. I like to play in all of them and see what I like and what ends up working. I'm, I'm platform agnostic. Like I want to help people. I want to serve, right? I'm trying to solve the world's biggest problem. I need to get video content out there. And as of right now for long form, YouTube is the king and there's nothing even close as a number two. What is the, uh, what's the thing about YouTube that you dislike the most? Ooh, I don't really think in those terms. That's a great question. Um, probably the inability to do video messaging with people. Oh, like one-on-one, like, like -on you mean? Yeah, like if you ask me, what do I like the most about Instagram? It's, it's video DMs. It, like, a lot of action goes down in the DMs on Instagram. And what I love doing is making videos. So I'll be walking on the street. This morning, I'm walking on the street. I'm Canadian. I got my Tim Hortons coffee. Walking to go get it. And, I, and I'm answering people's DMs from my phone. And like eight seconds long. You know, it's like, Jason, looking forward to today's episode, man. Love you send like super basic on the street. Really people say it's so authentic. Cool. I mean, it's just, I love being able to send video messages to people and YouTube has no message. Like YouTube is the worst from a social media perspective. You can't, you can't really communicate. You can't message people really well and you can't do it over video. So that's been the one thing that I wish YouTube would have because that would really make things super fun and amazing. You know, that that's a very interesting perspective, Evan. I, I didn't, uh, and we're talking with Evan Carmichael. If anybody's just now tuning in, this is Evan Carmichael, 3.4 plus million views on YouTube, very successful entrepreneur, has a heart for entrepreneurs. But it's a very interesting perspective that you just you just mentioned there because that that is interesting because YouTube is the one 
I, I don't even know if you'd really refer to it as social media, although it is media for sure, but it's not, doesn't have much social aspect to it. You can make a comment, you can hit a like or a dislike button, which they took away the dislike button for a while. That was kind of funny, but, but I think that there isn't much social to it. And what you just mentioned is, I wonder if YouTube is thinking about that because Google, you know, for years it tried to do Google plus and all that kind of stuff that didn't work. Maybe that's their platform to figure out how do we get people communicating socially in YouTube where we see what's happening in people's lives. That's a very, I had never thought about that. That's a very interesting, interesting perspective. I mean, I think it would, it would mean a major shift in leadership because they, they tried a whole bunch of things to try to do it. Um, they have community tab, which was supposed to be like an Instagram thing where you're posting content pictures and videos and connecting with people. Um, it's okay. They, they have stories, you know, they copied snap and now Instagram with the stories and it's okay. But what do they do best? They do, they're, they're best at content and the shorts have done super well. They, they want to, they want to be TikTok on the shorts and the long form. There's nobody close. Yeah. So I don't think it's a priority for them to do messaging and community and especially video messaging. Like you can't go live on YouTube and bring somebody in, right? Like you can go live to YouTube, but to bring somebody in on camera with you, if we were going to do this live, I'd have to use OBS. I'd have to use something else to be able to, to bring us in where Instagram, TikTok, it's all native inside the actual application. Huh. Um, so yes. Yeah, so it's just not a community thing. And, and I love, as much as I'm an introvert and shy, like I love, you put me around an entrepreneur, I light up. And so I love the community part to it. But why I don't go live on YouTube as much compared to Instagram or the other platforms is every question that I answer is just off of what they put in the chat. And, and you know, as you know, when you're helping somebody, the question they have is never the question they actually write. It's like the third level down that you, you only get when you're actually talking to them. So I'm only answering surface level questions from the text. And it's just not as rich a uh, dialogue. Um, so I've talked to them a whole bunch of times about this stuff. It doesn't seem, I, I would not hold my breath for any momentum on those things, but um, yeah, the fact that you asked, that's what came to mind. Well, it's an interesting, interesting perspective. I mean, you, you have been a very successful entrepreneur in several different arenas. Uh, YouTube seems to be, you know, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be an, a horizon in sight where it's going to end. You, you seem to be posting tremendously valuable content on a very regular basis. And based on this conversation today, I, I don't really see you pausing that or, or stopping it or going on to something different. It seems like that thing, but what do you, th this is the root of all success as a show. So what do you, Evan McCarmichael, what, how do you define that term success? It's feeling like I wake up every day and I do something that matters. You know, I think at the end of the day, we all want to feel like we matter that the work that we do matters. If you wake up every day and feel like you don't matter and your work doesn't matter and you're kind of going to a job that you hate and you're going to make something that nobody cares about, I think that's the path to anxiety and stress and depression and suicide and addiction and everything else. But if, if you woke up and felt like, you know what, today is going to matter. Maybe not to the world, but to at least one person. Like today, I'm going to do something that will matter to at least one human being. I think that's the path to success, happiness, fulfillment, um, all of it. And so, uh, yeah, we all want to feel like we do something that matters to other people where it's, it's hardwired into us doing it for ourselves is not enough. You have to feel like you're doing something for others too. Well, with that as a definition for success, do you consider yourself to be a successful person? Yeah. Um, there's, there's always the push. And I think this is inside every entrepreneur to want to do more right? Like I want to solve the world's biggest problem. I'm never going to do it in my lifetime, but I'm waking up every day trying to do it. And then also being grateful for what you do have and recognizing, Hey, you've, you've done a lot. So I'm, I'm far more uh, excited by the individual comments that I get on the videos. Like when somebody says, Hey, your video changed my life or really shifted my perspective or like, thank you so much. And the stories that have come out over the years have been just incredible. Um, mind blowing those always feel so much better than hitting how many subscriber count, you know, so 3 million subscribers or half a billion views. I don't, I don't know how to, what does that mean? Half a billion views. Cool. It's, it's great. It's a number. It's awesome. But like, it allows me to reach people hopefully in a rich way. And it's, it's more the qualitative feedback that makes you come alive to feel like you're making an impact. So what is the world's biggest problem according to Evan Carmichael? 
people don't believe in themselves enough. Like whatever problem you think is a problem, I think that's solved by somebody. You know, the cancer is the world's biggest problem. Cool. I think the woman who solves cancer doesn't solve it because, or hasn't solved it yet because she doesn't believe that she's great. And she never believed in herself enough to go to medical school. And now she's working some job at an accounting firm, hating her life. You know, like, I think everybody's got, I call it Michael Jordan level genius at something. You're the greatest in the world at something. And it's probably not what you went to school for. And it's probably not what your parents did for a living. It's something else. And you have to find it. And, and in a 2022, 2023 environment, now it's actually possible, right? Like when my parents were my age, these things were not possible. Now it is. And so there's no excuse. And it's, it's like having your show here, documenting success. Like if people say, well, I have no role models. I don't, I, nobody in my family has had success. Cool. Uh, do you know the real Jason Duncan? You can go, go listen to his show. He's bringing on successful people every, you know, consistently and they can pour that into your ear and it'll guide you towards success. It's never been easier and it's only getting easier to go chase on the thing that you could be the world's greatest at. Well, that's, um, I, I agree with you. I think the sentiment about people not believing in themselves is a problem. I think we, we have, uh, there's the imposter syndrome that we deal with as entrepreneurs. We feel like we're imposing. I mean, you even said in your story, it was what's the 350 videos before you could watch your video without being embarrassed or feel weird about it. You didn't believe in yourself. And now you've got a channel with millions and millions of followers, subscribers and commenters, and it's changing people's lives. I, I would agree. I would ask you though, that what then is the solution to that? I know it's going to be different to fix it worldwide, but individually, if a person hasn't yet figured out and believed in themselves enough to know what I'm the greatest in the world at, how would you advise them? What would you tell them to do to figure that out? So I have a model of personal growth and depending on where you're at on the model, you need different things. And the, the beginning, at the very beginning are, are the people who are, I call them complainers. They're not bad people. They're just, everything is a complaint. They, they hate their lives and they feel stuck and they feel trapped. And this is where most people are. Like most people just feel trapped. They don't know how to get ahead. And they might look at you and say, oh, well, easy for you because you, and they make up some story. But meanwhile, you had a hard time too. It's like, if it wasn't just given to you and poof, here you are, right? You went through your journey, but most people feel trapped. They feel stuck. And so those are the people who actually want to help the most because that's, you know, 99% of the world. Um, then we move on to, um, you know, wannabes, like you're kind of starting, but stopping and starting, stopping. You believe it's possible, but you don't believe it's possible for you. Mm. Right? Then we start getting to uh, people who are achievers and then high achievers. Uh, and I love helping those people too, but at the beginning stage is where most people are stuck. So how do you help somebody who doesn't feel like it's possible to be helped? And this is, we were talking about, you know, before we launched about branding, this is where I really struggle with my brand because I looked at people who I've worked with, like Tony Robbins, et cetera. And you look at their website and you see people like jumping up and down and going crazy. And for you and I, we look at that and be like, that'd be fun. That's cool. I mean, I've been to his events. They're amazing. But for the average person looking at it, they'll say, well, that's some cult, right? Like that's crazy. Those are grown adults dancing in the stadium. Are you, are you kidding me? Most people who have a negative mindset, they're just stuck, would see that as not for me. And I have to be the opposite. I need, I want to solve the world's biggest problem. It's not enough to just help the high achievers it's to help everybody. And so what do they need the most? I don't have the answer, but I'm working every day trying to find the answer. My best guess at it is environment and community. So if, if I can put enough content into the environment by my videos, by sharing other people's stories, by coming on people's shows, by encouraging other thought leaders to get their message out to the world, then hopefully the person at the right time when they're struggling finds the right piece of content that starts to shift them forward. I'm obsessed with helping people. I ask the question, like, how, how, what made this shift for you to get into this journey of growth? And it's almost always hitting some kind of rock bottom moment. And they're so struggling and they're so fed up with their life and they won't tell other people about it, but they go online and they search, how do I have success, right? How do I, whatever. And then they come across your video or my video or somebody else, a piece of content. And so it's influencing the environment. Um, and then community is more, hey, the more you see people around you winning, the more you feel like it's possible. So even if everybody around you is negative and hates their life and is struggling, but if you see one person who's doing it, even not on a big scale, but like doing it or happy or optimistic or chasing on their goals, it can plant a seed. And so the more we can get people to plant seeds and, and being a little more optimistic and believe um, 
that sparks ripples out to a whole other group of people as well. Um, so taking as many people on me with the journey, but I'm open to feedback too. You know, this is, this is what I'm struggling with. Like I could, it's easy for us to do it individually, right? Like if somebody were to live with you or you're going to meet them every day and you're going to, you're going to wake them up out of bed and help, like they will move forward. You will help them real Jason Duncan will get them to a different spot, but that's not scale. That's not changing the world. I want to hit every human on planet earth. So I need to be thinking, okay, that's why YouTube makes a lot of sense. You know, that's why other platforms can make sense because it has to hit it at a global level. Well, and that's, you, you were just saying that, you know, and to help people through the community to believe in themselves, that they have to be exposed to things that, and be exposed to the fact that, well, it can happen. And that's the beauty of how I think your, your message about you believing that people need to believe in themselves and that's a big problem and that you believe one of the solutions is being in community and seeing it in the environment that that's that that synchronicity between what you just said and how you're living your life are perfectly balanced because YouTube is where people see that happen. They log onto YouTube and they watch a video like yours and they say, Oh, well, that's how Muhammad Ali pushed through this, or that's how Jeff Bezos did this, or that's how Tony Robbins did this or, or whomever you're providing the solution to the problem you're trying to trying to solve, even though you admit that you don't really know the total answer. So congratulations for making your mi mission in life fit with what you're actually doing. And I would guess that it wasn't necessarily on purpose. You did YouTube because you wanted to do it. You liked video content. Then later you recognize the problem is people don't believe in themselves. And then you realize that if people just saw other people doing it, they would believe in themselves. So congratulations for being able to put those things together, whether you planned it or not, because I will tell you this, I have a mastermind called the Exeter club and uh, we meet once a month and we do about a three hour and it's all zoom because people from all over the, all over the country. And I show typically I'd show a little, you know, five or six minute inspirational video. Well, last month I showed one of your videos. And so you are inspiring people to do better things and to believe in themselves. And so Thank you for that. What is the biggest uh, challenge that you're facing right now as individually or as an entrepreneur? What, what, what's going on in Evan's life? What's the big challenge you're facing, good or bad? Lack of belief. It's still my number one problem too. Yeah, it's like lack of belief to do the next thing. And even knowing what the next thing is, right? So I've got, this is why, I mean, I'm not a fan of 10-year goals. If you're like, where are you going to be in 10 years? I have no idea. You can think about who you were 10 years ago. Yeah. Would you say, I'm going to be here making a podcast, interviewing Evan Carmichael talk? It's like, there's no way. Not, not if you're growing, not if you're learning. Like if you can, if you can hit your 10-year goal with any degree of certainty, you, I think you actually hate your life because you're not growing and learning. The things that will be available to you, you have no idea what you're capable of on a one-year window, let alone 10 years. So where am I going? I don't know. I mean, I just came back from Phoenix. I filmed a VR course for my book, Built to Serve. I wouldn't have said I'd be filming a VR course a year ago. And now here we are. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to solve it's, it's purpose, right? It's like, well, and then I have no path or clarity. Well, I'm, I'm trying to solve the world's biggest problem, right? I want people to believe in themselves more. Great. So to achieve that, I need to, I need to hit people at scale. Great. That's some kind of direction, but I still don't believe in myself enough to take whatever the next big leap is. I'm still more risk adverse than probably I should be. Um, and so it's helpful to be around people who then point out blind spots and say, Hey, Evan, like you suck here. Let's go in a loving way. Not like you suck as a human, but you're, you're playing small here. Like, what if you did this? What if you open up your mind to go here? Um, and it's still just lack of belief. Would you say, thing. would you, would you say then that your key or one of the keys to your success as an entrepreneur is the fact that while you still think you don't believe in yourself totally, would you say that one of the keys to your success is the fact that you did believe in yourself and you were able to become successful as a result of that? For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, every major breakthrough in my life or career has come on the other side of me believing a little bit more in yourself in myself. And, and that's always a process. So I go through this process in both my books of figuring out what's your most important core value, right? If you had to pick Jason Duncan's most important core value, what would, what would you say? My most important core value for me mm -hmm. individually is family. Cool. And so if that's the most important core value, then it's something that you need more for yourself, but also the gift to the world. Like if you can have other people believe more in family for, for their own family, but also the, the family of like, if they treated their customers like family and their team, like family, 
the, the impact that that would have would be tremendous. And your, your next level of growth is being even more about family. How do we inject even more family into what I'm doing? That's right. I love it. And so it's like, it's our greatest gift to the world and it's gotten you here. Like without the support of your family, you would not be here. Correct. And now here you are. And the next big breakthrough is even more family than what you've done so far. And that's for everybody. Like, how do you then apply family to the world? Like, imagine if everybody believed a little bit more in family because of Jason Duncan's existence, right? Same thing for me. I believe myself to get here. I wouldn't have done a show with you 10 years ago. I'd be too nervous. Oh my God. What does this guy even want to talk about me? Are you kidding me? Right. What, what are the questions? What is all this? What's the script? I'd be so nervous. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said, yeah, I find some excuse as to why I can't do it. Right now I've done enough of them. This is, this is easier for me, but there's a bunch of other stuff that I'm probably not even aware of that I need to do that. I don't believe in myself enough. And it's of such a blind spot that I'm not doing it. And so again, even for me, I make my videos for me. Every time I'm thinking bigger, like I'm, I'm crushed. I'm doing well. I watched an Elon Musk video about having a backup plan for humanity by going to Mars. Like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking so small. His, he's buying Twitter. It's like, how does that even, how did, how did he think through that? Right. Like I'm thinking so small, not as a, not as a kick down. People say like, don't compare yourself to others. I think it's actually great to compare yourself to others as long as you use it properly, not as a kick down, but a kick forward. The fact that someone like Elon Musk exists, who's thinking at a different scale is inspirational to me to say, okay, where am I just playing small and not taking a big enough step forward to? Yeah. Well, as we finish our conversation today, I want to give you the opportunity to give some advice. Uh, think about the people that are listening to this show that are on the very beginning stages of their journey as an entrepreneur. Of course, there's people that are on the very end of their stages and everywhere in between. But Evan Carmichael has what piece of advice for the people in the beginning stages of their journey as an entrepreneur? It has to be believe. Yeah. But believe in what you're doing. Believe that it will work out. Believe that someone like you can do it. Believe that you're doing the right thing and believe in the intention that you're putting out, that it may not work exactly like you think it's going to work out. But if you keep going because you believe in your heart that this is the right thing to do that will serve others, then it will work out. Believe. Evan, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's such a pleasure to talk with you again. I know we talked a long time ago, but it's great to have you on the show. I appreciate the kind words and appreciate the advice, the perspective that you've given. Uh, Congratulations on your success. I look forward to continue to subscribe and follow your channel on YouTube so that we can model the masters and learn how they do it. And uh, everybody needs to go check out your new book, Built to Serve. It's going to really reveal your heart about who you are trying to serve people to get them to believe in themselves. So Evan, Thank you so much for doing this today. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate you, man. Well, there you have it. Another very successful entrepreneur, Evan Carmichael, kind of talking about his story and how he became successful and what he believes about success and how he's doing things that matter, trying to solve the world's biggest problem, which is people don't believe in themselves. And uh, I want you to reach out to Evan. You can go to evancarmichael.com. Of course, that's that'll be the hub for everything. But his YouTube channel is Modeling the Masters. So if you go to youtube.com slash Modeling the Masters, you'll be able to get access to them there. But he's on everything. He's on Facebook. He's got a fan page. He's got he's on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Pinterest, Discord. You know, anywhere out there, just go look up Evan Carmichael. A really nice guy, like just genuine. You can see his heart, hear his heart and how he's talking about it. So I'm very grateful that he was on the show today. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, I want you to please take a moment to do that and then uh, and leave a good review because people like Evan, you know, they're awesome. And, and I want to be able to get really great top level entrepreneurs like him on the show. And the more reviews we have and the more people listening, the more opportunity we get to get those great guests so that you can hear me talk to them about their journey to success. If you're trying to get to the journey, if you're trying to get through your journey to success and you want a little help, remember one of the things that Evan talked about in, in our show today was he talked about the fact that we need guides, we need mentors, we need people to help us along the way. So I want to offer myself as one of those potential guides or mentors for you as a business coach. And one of the ways that you can get involved in that is by enrolling in one of my live group coaching programs called the Business Accelerator. And the Business Accelerator is an eight lesson, one hour at a time, live experience with me and no more than 12 entrepreneurs where I take you through the four core principles 
on what you need to know to build a business that does not revolve around you. It allows you to exit without exiting. That's what I call it. So you can run the business with other people doing it so you can move on to the more important things in your life, whether it's starting another business, whether it's spending more time traveling, whatever it happens to be, you don't have to sell the business to wait to live the exit lifestyle. You could do that now. The business accelerator will accelerate your path towards that, that goal. So if you're interested in that, go to exitwithoutexiting.com. That's exitwithoutexiting.com. You could do one or two things there. You can, you can apply to, to have a call with me and we could talk about what it's like to be a part of it. Or you can scroll all the way to the bottom of the page and go ahead and sign up for the next one. I've got one starting soon. We meet on Thursday mornings for one hour and there's eight sessions. And I've got a group going through it right now phenomenal entrepreneurs, great experiences. I'm teaching them some cool stuff, but they're but better than that is that they're realizing that they can actually have the freedom that they wanted when they started the company to begin with. And they're beginning to, as Evan would say, believe in themselves that they can actually get there. So go to exitwithoutexiting.com, check it out. And again, Thanks again to Evan Carmichael for being my guest today. Make sure that you tune in again next week here on The Root of All Success when I talk with yet another very successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. Until then, I am the real Jason Duncan, and Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.